how can this car go hundreds of miles without using gas? What keeps a ballet dancer on her toes? Why is a wire spring making an old chore easier? Who would want to make baseball bats out of plywood? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Back in 1911, this is how a new car was delivered from the factory to most parts of the country, under its own steam. Did we say new car? Well, it was no longer quite new when it finally reached the customer. Skeptics then were still shouting, get a horse, and with pretty good reason, for they often had to call on a horse to get the gas buggy to its destination. But times change and methods of delivering cars have undergone just about as drastic a transformation as the cars themselves. Here at the Buick plant in Flint, Michigan, we can get an idea of just how remarkable a transformation that has been. As the gleaming new automobiles roll off the assembly line, you'd hardly guess that they are the direct descendants of that woe-begone vehicle we saw plowing through the mud. Bigger, faster, sturdier, more comfortable, and far more beautiful. It would be a shame to send them to a buyer in Minneapolis or Miami on their own, even over the highways of today. So in keeping with other advances of the automobile industry, here's how they'll make the trip. Riding piggyback, four at a time, aboard the ingenious auto carriers that have become so familiar. They're tied down with chains front and rear as a safety precaution and to prevent damage to the car in transit. Safety, incidentally, is of paramount interest. And Ernie Mattingoy here has been driving carriers for 20 years without a single accident. He and his fellow drivers of the National Automobile Transportation Association have a far better record even than the trucking industry generally, which itself has a far better record than average motorists. Hundreds, even thousands of miles away, four expectant new car owners are anxiously awaiting delivery of the four beauties Ernie is hustling in their direction. And here they are at their destination, as bright and clean as when they rolled off the assembly line and passed the final inspection. And though already it has come a considerable distance, the speedometer shows it's been driven less than one mile. Since the founding of this nation, Americans have practiced a system of free, individual, competitive enterprise. Our belief is private capitalism, as we practice it in America, has produced more goods for more people than any other economic system known to man. Unlike the communist slave system, under our form of capitalism, we continue to keep the strength, security, and living standards of all the people on a constantly rising scale. All of us, in the home, in the factory, and on the farm, have benefited by America's system of freedom and opportunity. After many years, ballet emerges as an integral part of American culture. No longer a mere adjunct of opera or musical comedy, ballet now stands on its own merits while reflecting its new American origin and inspiration. Television bringing the dance into the living room deserves part of the credit. And in the background of this changing scene are specialized industries like Capezio on Manhattan's Broadway. Capezio, the dancer's cobbler. For nearly 70 years, they've concentrated on the making of dancing shoes, a craft requiring in many ways as much skill and training as dancing itself. Let's follow through the making of what is called a toe shoe, the kind in which a dancer can stand or leap about on tiptoe with greater steadiness than you or I enjoy in a pair of sandals. Traveling down a line of seamstresses, various parts of the uppers are gradually assembled. These are made of satin and other fabrics. Into the binding that goes around the top is the all-important drawstring that will hold the shoe on the foot as snugly as possible.
Meanwhile, the soles are stamped out. In toe shoes, the sole does not extend the full length of the foot. That's to allow the foot to point. A process called channeling opens up the leather so that when the sole is sewed to the upper, the stitches will be made through this flap. Now we're ready for the real assembly operation to begin. The upper of a dancing shoe, or at least that portion of it called the toe box, is built up in many layers, which must be glued together with a precision that requires long years of experience. At the extreme end of the toe tip goes a small, soft felt pad, but over it are laid half a dozen or more layers of fabric to help support the foot in the tip toe, or on point position as it's known in ballet. He works rapidly, but each piece of fabric must be set in exact position if the dancer is not to be thrown off balance. Famous dancers like Pavlova and Nijinsky came here for their professional footwear, starting a tradition that has flourished with the years. Now, upside down, the sole is tacked to the wooden last as we prepare to join sole and upper. The upper goes on inside out. Now he pulls the layers of material taut over the toe of the last. Forming the pleats is extremely important to the fit and comfort of the shoe. Seems like an awful lot of work to go into a pair of slippers, and even more so when you learn that a hard dancing professional can go through a pair in just one evening. With the pleats stitched down tight with strong, waxed linen thread, excess fabric is trimmed away. Finally, sole and upper are sewed together. Now it can be removed from the last and turned satin side out by the artisan who shaped it. The way the toe box is tamped out and shaped is another of the critical operations affecting comfort of the shoe. A shank is glued in place, and after hours of additional shaping, roughing and scoring of the sole, and slow, patient drying of the glues, eventually, the shoes are ready for the customer. It may be a tall chief or Markova, or then again, it may be someone placing a first tentative foot on the bottom rung of the ladder, as here at the School of American Ballet, one of many schools now trying to keep up with an unprecedented interest in the dance. Whether or not one of these youngsters develops into a great star, those craftsmen back at Capezio will have good reason for taking pride in their role in advancing our most rapidly growing art form. Industry tackles an old problem of the electrical trade. These are a few of the tedious operations involved in making old-fashioned wire splices. The result is a bulky, awkward connection that's weak, poorly insulated, and likely to heat up in use. At firms like Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company of St. Paul, a problem like that is right down the alley for staff research scientists. They approach it from several directions at once. Here, for example, they work on synthetic resins, developing a compound that will not only insulate, but protect an electrical circuit as well. Several possible combinations are thoroughly tested. The result, two chemicals in a plastic bag. Break the wall that separates them, and they'll combine into a hard, moisture-proof block of electrical insulation. As for joining the wires so they'll really hold without increasing electrical resistance, the answer to that 
was a tapered coil spring connector, which also undergoes exhaustive testing. Now in production, the new developments are getting their conclusive tests in the hands of the men for whom they were turned out. When the spring connector is in place, the handle is broken off. The splice can be insulated with a new plastic electrical tape, or as in the case of splices that must be buried underground, it can be embedded in the new protective synthetic resin. What we have seen aren't the only answers to the electrician's problems, nor will they be the last. For to the scientists of industry, finding better ways of doing things is a way of life. There is hardly a day passes that you don't see or read about some new medicine, gadget, machine, or a new comfort on the market. To do this each year, industry sets aside from its earnings more than $1 billion for research to discover new products or improve those already being made. This research is working for you because these new and improved products mean better and less expensive things for all of us. In addition, they mean more and better jobs with an ever greater opportunity for better living for everybody. Spring training for Pittsburgh Pirate Farm players at Huntsville, Texas. But actually, it's from this little plant in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that the real rookie of the year may emerge. A new type of baseball bat. Here at the Joe Engel Bat Company, bats are made not out of one solid piece of wood, but out of several layers laminated together. The handle and core of the bat are of hickory for strength. The faces and end are of birch to resist chipping. The powerful glue that holds the wood together is dried by electronic heat applied under great pressure. Doesn't look much like a bat at this point, but wait just a minute and it will. Personal bats for stars like Stan Musial are shaped by hand to take care of their special requirements. But most of them are shaped by these whirling knives in a matter of seconds. Now they'll be sanded, have the trademark burned in, be varnished, and then shipped out to just about every ball club in the country. Lamination was introduced by our wood processing industries years ago, primarily as a conservation measure to use up wood that would otherwise go to waste. But improvement followed improvement until now laminated wood is stronger than the unlaminated any day. As with traditional bats, this new type is held with the trademark facing up. All right, let's give it a try. Forbes Field, here we come. 